Welcome back to the show. Well, today we're talking about the fundamental rights of Canadians and whether or not they have been breached by governments in the COVID-19 management. My guest today is the last remaining political leader alive who actually helped craft the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Joining me today, the Honourable Brian Peckford. Every day there's more and more people concerned about what's going on and whether in fact it's all constitutional. There's only one exception where the Charter of Rights and Freedoms can be overridden to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. Everything done since the pandemic started, they have not demonstrably justified was needed. And therefore, they didn't have the power to override all of our freedoms and rights. Canada's original constitution, the British North American Act, was passed in 1867, and at that time, Canada's constitution did not have a Bill of Rights that governments had to follow. In 82, the Charter was added to the constitution, and the guarantee of rights and freedoms in the Charter became a part of the supreme law of the land. Having a Charter of Rights and Freedoms in our constitution has brought Canada in line with other Western democracies in the world all of whom have bills of rights that can be enforced by the courts to protect its private citizens. Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms includes freedoms such as freedom of conscience, religion, thought, belief, expression, the press, peaceful assembly, association, mobility rights, the right to liberty and security of the person, some would say that in this season, it could be argued that many of these rights of Canadians have been breached. Well, here today to discuss the Charter and if or when it is ever granted by law to override the Charter rights of Canadians is none other than the Honourable Brian Peckford. Mr. Peckford is a very accomplished Canadian political leader. He was born in Newfoundland before it was Newfoundland Labrador, and he was also the first Conservative to gain a seat in its Legislative Assembly. He went on to to be the premier from 79 to 89 and is the only remaining premier that was at the table with Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau and his government as they crafted the Canadian Charter. He's such an important voice for such an important conversation to so many of us right now. We sure appreciate you joining us. Without any further delay, let's get to it. Well, none other than the Honourable Brian Peckford. Thank you so much for joining me today, sir. You're kindly welcome. Good to be here. You know, well, to say that this is a critical conversation is an absolute understatement. Uh, you are the only remaining uh, architect that's still alive today that was involved in the crafting of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So first off, I just want to drive right into it and talk about what was it that motivate you all, motivated you all at the time? Why was it so important for you to craft the charter and then also to encase it inside of the Constitution? Well, there have been a number of uh, uh, efforts made over the years uh, to craft something that will go in the Constitution, which better protected the individual rights and privileges, if you will, uh, freedoms, rights and freedoms, I should say, of citizens of the country. In 1960, the Honorable John Diefenbaker introduced into the House of Commons the Bill of Rights. And he should be acknowledged because it was the first time that rights of citizens was in, put into any kind of law. This was the law of Canada as passed through uh, the House of Commons, the federal government in 1960. Up until that time, we operated as it relates to rights and privileges of citizens under the old uh, British system, which was one of precedence. So it's not that there wasn't any rights and freedoms before 1960, it was none were written down. They were a matter of precedent. And so the courts looked to what other courts had decided and then build on that. So it is open and people had to use those kinds of precedents to establish uh, their rights or freedoms. So Mr. Diefenbaker in 1960 actually established for the first time in some part of law, uh, rights and freedoms of citizens, but it only applied to federal law and federal institutions. It wasn't covering the whole country, just the federal government part of it. 
And so there was a something left out. But he should be acknowledged for, for the first time, introducing into law rights and freedoms. Mr. Diefenbaker was responsible for that. So we weren't breaking completely new ground, even though a lot of historians try to say that. But it's not true, because the, the uh, Bill of Rights is there for anybody to see. Exhibit A. So Mr. Diefenbaker must be acknowledged and his government for that. But it wasn't all encompassing, and therefore uh, there was a gap. But the other part of it was, is that we were still linked to, uh, to England, and any amendments to our BNA Act, which was our main written piece of legislation for changes, had to refer back to the United Kingdom for final sanction. So patriation of the Constitution meant bringing the Constitution in all its ways and forms from England to Canada, so that in future any new amendments would be made just by Canadians. And the second part was to add to it the things that were missing in 1960 Bill of Rights. Mr. Trudeau, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, was very insistent, uh, as were other premiers, were interested in doing this patriation and also a Charter of Rights and Freedoms. As we got into this, um, the Prime Minister of Canada, Mr. Trudeau, decided that we were being too difficult as premiers and that he would go and do it on his own. The provinces said, no, you can't do that. That's illegal. That's unconstitutional. And we took Prime Minister Elliot Trudeau and his government to court. And the Supreme Court of Canada ruled the customs and conventions since 1867 clearly state that a federal government in changing a constitution, because the constitution is both federal and provincial, will be stepping on provincial powers in certain areas. And therefore, the provinces had to be involved and a majority of the provinces had to agree to any changes. So after the Prime Minister lost in the Supreme Court of Canada, he came back to the table. And then we negotiated what now is the Constitution Act of 1982, in which one of the components is the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Now, I want to ask a question here because I, I've heard you talk about this, how you felt and your colleagues at the time felt it was critical to have the charter inside the Constitution yes. so that future yes. governments couldn't come and, and sort of easily flip it and, and mess with it. Is that correct? Exactly. And that was the whole reason for it, because the, the limited Bill of Rights of 1960 was just a federal act. So any majority government could come in at any time and quite easily change it. By putting it in the Constitution, it took it away from the Parliament and made it far more difficult to change the Constitution, because to change the Constitution, you need seven out of ten provinces and over 50 percent of the population. And in, in cases, some of the cases here, you would need unanimity. So by putting it in the Constitution, we enshrined it in a document which was beyond the easy access for a petty small-minded government to change just because they had a majority in the Parliament of Canada. That's what we thought at the time, and that's what's been in existence since it passed in uh, what was sort of approved in 1981 and passed in 1982 until this present pandemic came up, which has shown that even though it was in the Constitution, governments feel, feel that they still have the right to go ahead and do things uh, which violate the Constitution without ever going through the procedures that we thought were beyond a normal way of operating and breaking. Well, well this, is, this is also incredibly eye-opening, and hopefully the courts will deal with this justly at the highest level, and hopefully sooner rather than later. But you've been sounding the alarm on this, Mr. Peckford. You've been writing the premiers. You've been challenging them on the constitutionality of uh, their behaviors on, on different levels. Now, I'm just going to rattle off a few things here from uh, the Charter. You know, we have freedom of conscience. We have uh, freedom of religion, freedom of peaceful assembly, freedom of mobility, uh, freedom of mobility for the purpose of earning a living. Um, these types of things are enshrined in the Charter. And yet there's this one section. So those start to rattle out in Section 2. Uh, but Section 1 talks about the one instance when governments can actually override these charter rights. Can you unpack that for our viewers? What's in section one? Yes, absolutely. I would love to. And this is this is crucial for Canadians who are concerned. And there's quite, I think every day there's more and more people concerned of what's going on. 
and whether in fact it's all constitutional. So it's very important for people to understand this. All of these rights and freedoms that are there in Charter of Rights and Freedoms that are now in our Constitution, there's only one exception where they can be overridden, where your rights and my rights as individuals can be surpassed, overridden. And they, we dealt with that in section number one. Before we got into all the rights and freedoms, we said at the time that these could be overridden. And the situation is the Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. I am arguing that everything that every government in Canada has done since the pandemic started, they have not demonstrably justified was needed. And therefore, they didn't have the power to override all of our freedoms and rights. But they haven't, they haven't demonstrably justified what they're doing is necessary. And if you look at Sweden, where they didn't bring in a lot of this, a lot of states in the United States, where, they had, where they've had the pandemic just as severe or just there available <laughs> to, to infect people, they didn't go the route that Canada has gone and other countries have gone because it wasn't necessary. It was necessary to do something, but it wasn't necessary to do, do the draconian measures that a lot of governments have done and that the Canadian government has done and continues to do. Okay, and so you're challenging not only the federal government on this point of Section 1, but also the premiers, uh, pretty much everyone. Now, and so let's talk about the free and democratic part, because uh, we have been noticing here the, the mass shutdown of dissenting voices, whether it's a, a doctor, a nurse, you've got Dr. Byron Brittle, a, a very astute academic virologist, right, from the University of Guelph there. These are credible voices. These are not snowflakes. Like, these are people that know their field and they're, they're flagging concerns, and these voices are canceled. Um, and so what you're basically, are you edging into this to say, okay, if to demonstrably justify this, you've got to let all voices come forward with the full strength. You've got to allow a robust debate in the context of parliament, which was pretty much canceled for most of the pandemic. Exactly. Um, and, exactly. and, and, and may the best, may the best proof win. Is, is that what you're saying? And is that what you're it, saying? It, didn't it, happen? Exactly. The first thing that should have been done, well, there were certain things that they could do without violating the constitution those they should have done, especially the most vulnerable. For the first 90 days of the pandemic, one can understand it was a new, it was a new disease, if you will, even though over the years, you know, swine flu, whatever, you can go back and see a lot of them. Fine, okay, you, you give them some allowance, okay. But after about 90 days, it became quite clear that there was a lot of data being accumulated very quickly, that the people who are most vulnerable in this kind of circumstance with this kind of pandemic were the elderly the people over 70, but not just people over 70, people over 70 with a number of other ailments or sicknesses which reduced their immunity and made the, uh, the, the COVID more accessible to their system. So the first thing that should have been done was to protect the vulnerable and the vulnerable were the elderly. And uh, rather than start, you know, getting into restraining pre people's rights and freedoms under, under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And so after 90 days or 100 days, there was a lot of information around that governments could have built a framework of combating this um, uh, pandemic without taking away people's rights and freedoms. And the Great Barrington Declaration is a good example of this. You know, these three big global experts in epidemiology, were the first signatories to the Great Barrington Declaration that ended up having 40 or 50,000 scientists and doctors from all over the world sign it, and hundreds of thousands of concerned citizens sign it. And it said exactly what I just said, protect the vulnerable. You don't have to close the society down to get a handle on this pandemic. And people ignored them. As a matter of fact, some of these very leading epidemiologists were denigrated in the press Later, it had to be backtracked, by the way. Uh, and, uh, and, and so this was a real signal to the governments with leading you know, scientists in the world saying this. And governments, rather than sit down with these people and, and debate this and see how they could craft 
measures to combat the pandemic, because as we learned, the recovery rate was over 99% for anybody under 70. So um, that was a, the point at which uh, governments should have taken notice because it was experts speaking. And they did not. They did not. They were already into a fear mode, into a panic mode, and they continued on, as they're doing to this very day, to uh, enact measures which cannot be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. The problem we have is, is that we hooked our, our wagon to, a, to one star and then ignored all the other alternatives that were available. We love Canada, and we want to see it strong for generations to come. That's why we do this show. We can't do it alone. We need your help. Unlike commercial TV, this program is 100% donor funded. If you'd like to see more episodes produced on important issues for our nation, please consider signing up to be a monthly partner or giving a special gift today. Every gift makes a real difference and all gifts are tax deductible. Together, we can build a better Canada for the future. Visit fayteen.tv or call 1-866-844-0844 to donate today. The first thing the government really should have done when they looked at that, that <laughs> Charter of Rights and Freedoms was get a select committee or eat of the parliament and bring in experts and make it public and allow for, as you just said, a robust debate to, to uh, ensue and then for the committee to make recommendations to the full parliament and to government as that how they should proceed beyond what they already were doing or should they tailor it differently and target it differently. And that, that's where we fell down as a country, Canada did, but not in the United States, only parts of the United States. Uh, states like Florida, for example, and the, the Dakotas and other states did not go the route that we've gone. And, uh, and they have been highly successful in continuing their economies and getting a handle uh, on, the pan, uh, on the pandemic. So the other thing that happened, which was really unfortunate for a democratic society, is how this became all encompassing by the governments and no uh, country view was allowed. And now since then, since back in the even say March of 1990, the accumulation of data and evidence from Dr. McCullough, for example, in the United States, but from people all over the world. Uh, there's several different big organizations that have been formed now that have done wonderful scientific independent work, which demonstrates that the route, route, the route that most governments in the Western society took was a wrong route. Right. And, you know, what's also a tragedy here is that for some of our viewers, this is the first time that they're hearing some of this information uh, because it is it, the, the debate just hasn't been allowed to happen, even in the evening news, you know. So so in a moment here, I'm going to ask you, how do we as citizens, the government works for us. We pay their salaries, we pay their benefits, we pay their pensions with our tax dollars. Um, how do we hold governments to account on Section 1 in the context of the slow pace of the judiciary right now? But I also want to edge into, before we get there, into the current push with child vaccination, okay? So uh, some of the rights in the charter, freedom of conscience. I'm talking to parents. Some some are totally fine with it. They say, we, we trust the people that are saying this is good and clear. There are other parents that are like, you know what, this... Uh, this is is pushing my conscience to the limit. I'm willing to take a risk yeah. with myself, not willing to take a risk with my kids. But um, before, before, before you go there, you've got to understand all of the necessary procedures, and they will not be finished. All the clinical trials won't be finished until 2022, 2023 on these vaccines. So we're dealing with a, an experimental vaccine. It has experimental authorization. Okay? Experimental. It hasn't got permanent authorization. It has experimental, um, right? And most um, Canadians wouldn't know that. Wouldn't know that, right? And, and, and the other thing is all of the people who make these vaccines are held not responsible if anything happens. I grew up when, and, and, and my parents told me, you know, sunshine is very important. In Newfoundland, we weren't getting enough sunshine. So we took cod liver oil. Why the governments of Canada have not been saying, go out and get a test to see what your level of vitamin D is, because vitamin D counteracts, and if you do get it, your sickness will not be as great if you have sufficient vitamin D levels. Nobody is pushing 
vitamin D at all. And therefore, that's why all these conspiracy theories have grown up, and legitimately so. Why isn't the government, at the same time as they're talking about in all the press conferences, say, make sure you got your vitamin D levels up? Because in Canada, we're a northern country, and even in the middle of the summer, we're not getting the vitamin D levels that we need because we're not out in the sun long enough and the sun is not strong enough. No wonder, you know, there's been a, a, a people are accusing the government of conspiracy theories because things that are there at their disposal, zinc, kerosene, right, vitamin C and vitamin D that are now recommended by frontline doctors, by, uh, you know, groups of different doctors around the world. The, the, pro the problem we have is, is that we went on, a, we, we, we hooked our, our, uh, our wagon to, a, to one star and then uh, ignored all the other alternatives that were available. So the issue is not just that they didn't have all the studies done on these vaccines. The issue is also there were alternatives and are alternatives available which can help retard this pandemic and this disease. And they're not, and wherever they've used it, it's worked. And so this is the most tragic thing about this whole circumstance is that there are alternatives available which have not only been ignored, but have been almost denigrated. So, you know, and I want to remind our viewers uh, who's talking right now. OK, this is not your first rodeo, sir. You were the premier of Newfoundland, now Newfoundland Labrador. You helped craft the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And, uh, I, want to, you, and I want to remind people on that score, it was the Newfoundland proposal that broke the, 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 the uh, impasse on the 3rd, 4th and 5th of November 1981 that led to this Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We were deeply involved in it because it was our proposal that was put on the table on the midday of the 5th of November 1981 that led to the uh, to the charter that later afternoon. Right. So this is not your first rodeo, and we appreciate the hard work that you did uh, to make the charter happen. Thank you so much. So in a moment, we got we got to talk about Section 1 here and what people can do to hold our government's feet to the fire on that. But before I do, I, I've got to ask this, because I know there's people watching this. I know we're going to get the emails, and they're going to say, listen, you guys are inciting fear. You're being irresponsible. What do you say to that voice that just tries to discount uh, all the pragmatic points that you just made there? I, I say to them, we have to keep an open mind on all matters, especially when they involve health. So when people say to me, you know, um, why are you inciting fear? I'm not inciting fear. I'm inciting that there are many alternatives available that we should be using that we're not using. We know no long term effects. We know no medium term effects. And none of the companies have any liability. I mean, that is that's like a Middle Ages kind of situation where people didn't have the knowledge that we have today and then made themselves the king or the feudal lord, made, made himself immune from any liability. We're in, we're, <laughs> we, we've advanced beyond that, but yet we are allowing companies to produce products for which all the studies have not been completed. To me, that's, that's not a road to good recovery. Well, I sure appreciate both your passion and your logic. And I want to say this, when you're talking, I'm not getting afraid. I'm actually getting hopeful that there are all these alternatives, preventative and treatments. And, uh, you know, it's just logic, right? But everybody, as a result of this interview, can do the following. They can find out whether they have what their levels of vitamin D are. Go and get a test. You can, that's available to you in all the provinces to see where your vitamin D levels are. And take some additional vitamin C. Take some additional zinc. These things will build up your immunity. And if, in fact, you end up getting something, it will not be as harmful to you and you won't get a severe condition out of it and you'll be better in three or four days. Well, there you have it. You know, I want to say to our viewers, you are listening to the founding father of, or one of the founding fathers of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Listen to your father right now, okay? <laughs> so, okay, we got to close with this point here. Um, so let me ask you this, section one. How do the Canadians that are watching this right now hold our public officials to account on demonstrating beyond a shadow of a doubt in a free and democratic society that what they're doing is doing more good than harm? Yes, well, then every citizen of Canada should be writing their province, writing their MLA, writing their premier and writing their prime minister and saying we're we want to see more demonstration that what you're doing is valid and, and is in, consistent with the, uh, the, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, especially uh, section one. 
you have to demonstrably justify. They have not lifted a finger in all of the orders that you see out from all the provinces. Do you see anything in there with a special section uh, justification for doing this? Right? You know, demonstrably justifying this? Have they held hearings and brought in all the experts to see what's going on? Why is Sweden so successful? Why is Florida so, so successful? Why is South Dakota so successful? Why is the state of India with 220 million people? How many do we have in Canada? 37? A, a state, you know, 220 million people and have been successful in reducing almost to zero their COVID cases? So there's lots of evidence out there. And so uh, I would say to people, begin to do what a good democracy should be doing. Citizens have to get involved. A democracy is only healthy. A democracy will only last as long or and be good insofar as a citizen is involved, participates. That means writing letters. That means joining groups and to ensure that we have a more balanced approach to this going forward. Okay. And do you have hope? Do you have hope that we can turn this around and save more lives? Insofar as the citizen will get involved and get up off the couch and stop watching TV. Well, I could not agree more. We're closing in here. Uh, this is You've been so generous with both your wisdom, your passion, and your time today. Uh, the Honorable Brian Peckford, do you have any final words for our viewers today, sir? The only final words I have, as I, I just said, a, a, a democracy will only last. This democracy will only last as long as we have citizen participation, responsible citizen participation in your local municipalities, in your province, and start writing letters now and saying that you are concerned about the direction this country is going as it relates to taking certain information and not taking other information as it relates to our personal health. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you so much for all of this eye-opening information today. And we just want to say here at Fateen TV, we honor you for your incredible work in crafting and delivering to my generation, my children, and theirs, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. May we all use it well. Thank you very much. Well, I hope you found today's conversation insightful and helpful. We sure do appreciate you joining us. Well, if you're like me, you likely want to watch this again and absorb all that the Honorable Brian Peckford shared with us today. And perhaps you want to share it with your friends. Well, I have good news. You can do that by simply visiting fateen.tv, where this show is posted, as well as other previous episodes on important issues for our nation. If you would like to help us make more programs and keep on the air every single week talking about issues like today, Days, we would be so grateful for your support. As an independent talk show, we are dependent on the donations of our monthly partners and regular donors to keep at it. Every gift helps, and gifts are all tax receivable as well. To sign up to partner or to make a special gift today, simply visit fateen.tv or give us a call at 1 866 844 and our team would be honored to speak with you and serve you in any way that you need it. Thanks again for joining me. Hope to see you next week.